Uh, so we have five minutes, it's 20 slides. So it's all about you need to make a point and really focus on uh, a single topic, a theme that you explain to the audience. Uh, all the slides will be uh, sliding every 15 seconds. Uh, there's not gonna be any interaction. Uh, the way we'll pace each other is that we'll have uh, this picture. Uh, I want to give feedback. Please, uh, if you haven't done this, tweet, post on the uh, tweet wall, uh, use the sticky notes, give us feedback. We love feedback. We want to know how to improve it the same way uh, DevOps promotes this culture of continuous improvement. We also want to improve as organizers and to better organize this event and next event. These are our uh, awesome speakers. Uh, thanks again for submitting this awesome, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, thank you for the round of applause. Uh, they submitted great content. It took them uh, great strength uh, to send in a short notice. And a couple of them, we had this exchange of uh, changing some of the content. So it's been a journey. I would be very glad to appreciate if you can just spend the next 45 minutes really focusing on what they have to tell. Uh, nine speakers, nine different topics in a very fast manner. So with that, So uh, again, thanks for coming to DevOps Days. So what will I do is once uh, moves to the next slide, I'll pass the microphone to the speaker, and this way you will uh, pace yourself. So you'll see the picture of uh, the speaker. So our next speaker is Clamry. Yes. Next slide. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Clamry. I manage the DevOps product marketing team in the Visual Studio organization at Microsoft. I'm here today to tell you about the, our seven DevOps habits that we've developed in our own journey in moving to DevOps, um, moving from shipping every three years in a box to shipping every three weeks online. We've taken those learnings, we've productized them, baked them into our products so that our customers can benefit from the same learnings we have. So since 1975, Microsoft has been developing software in a certain way, the waterfall way. About six years ago, we realized that, you know, there's grave danger on the horizon and we better turn the ship around or we won't survive. Sorry, I just messed with your timing here. So we knew that DevOps is uh, something that affects the entire organization, but when we started to talk about this, there were many different opinions about what it is and every different person had its own idea. Thanks. So for us, the definition is a converged life cycle, converging the IT ops and the developer life cycle into a single unified life cycle. That allows us to execute rapidly on new ideas, to rapidly re re react to feedback, and um, the whole um, DevOps journey was really something that affected our entire organization and the discussion had to focus on process people and tools equally otherwise the transformation will fail. We defined these seven habits and three of those came from the agile world and four of them were new muscles that we needed to develop. These habits are broad mindset changes that everybody on the team had to internalize and live every single day. So let's go into each of these. The first one is the flow of value, which talks about taking software from initial idea to creation validation into the user's hands with the least amount of rework involved. The reduced rework allows the team then to focus on building more value and delivering that to the customer. Our DevOps practices are well documented and implement, easily implemented by individual teams and then enforced by the tools. So here are some of the practices that relate to flow of value. Team autonomy for us is all about being responsive. Responsiveness being short or flexible scheduling, short iterations, and team collaboration, which eliminates wasteful handoffs between teams. Each team has the freedom to self-organize and has full team autonomy. We have multidisciplinary feature teams who work from a single backlog and at the end of each iteration deploy into production. We don't tell our teams how to work or which rituals to embrace. Results are all that matter. We treat our backlogs as a set of hypotheses that we turn into experiments and then collect data. 
We also engage with our stakeholders to collect feedback. We take the data and the feedback and then plan our next move, should be persevere or should be pivot. We've implemented these practices in the, to help us collect information from various sources. All of this information we use to continuously refine our backlog in the changing environment that we're in. So good experiments yield actionable data, and we measure everything from health to availability to performance to service, uh, quality of service metrics and usage. So we can take the usage, use it as evidence to either prove or disprove prove an hypothesis on the backlog. We rely heavily on experimentation to fine tune our service and products. At any time, there's about 100 or more experiments running live in production. We then take the contrast from those cohorts, compare those, the weak, weak users and weekend users, and then hypothesize ways to improve experiences for each of those individual audiences. Coming to technical debt, this is something that slows down flow and progress. Technical debt slows down productivity, makes the code fragile, introduces bugs that again causes rework. We have uh, a mantra that each team will work to get their technical debt down to zero to eliminate long-term implementations. So we've implemented practices to help developers improve code quality, that's where it starts. After that, we rely heavily on automation and the team that has a production first mindset. What this means is that every single member on the team is now responsible for LifeSite, regardless of the role, not just IT operations. We don't use pre-production environments at all to deploy to. We deploy straight to production using canarying and progressive exposure via feature flags. And we've implemented practices that help us recover quickly, facilitate root cause analysis, and an architecture that fails gracefully with minimal impact. We use the flexible infrastructure as the public cloud to continually improve our architecture, to refactor to discrete services, and it gives us the ability to scale on demand, something that isn't um, easily done on an on-prem infrastructure. This has enabled us to implement many innovative DevOps services very quickly without huge capital outlay and only pay for what we use. So in, in summary then, Software development has changed, especially at Microsoft. All prerogatives and priorities have been shifted, and every software development organization, we believe, have to address these changes to survive. The question is not if it will hit you, but when it will hit you. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. That was great. Uh, Sorry, my name is Ben Henschel, so I am our Solution Director for our uh, App Dev Solutions for Asia Pacific. Um, I've been with Red Hat almost nine years and I have a real passion for open source, a real passion for making actual tangible changes and cultural changes in organisations and governments. So I'm going to be talking about are we bridging the cultural divide that is necessary for DevOps to succeed. And I hope this afternoon that I spark some self-reflection and introspection and, and questioning about are we doing the right things to make DevOps successful. And I think um, this is the metaphor. We spend a lot of time and money on our IT architectures and application architectures and we just can't get code out the door. Basically, we just can't drive the business and the government agency where it needs to get to in an agile and in a fast way. And it's not to say that this is bad, it's just to say it's not suitable to help us drive. So what to do? There are five, I think, interdependent facets that are contributing to the prevention of succeeding the DevOps strategy and they are communication, incentives, empathy, testing models and leadership. And we, we know that these five contribute to what we know on the ground is the cultural divide. Now, as Paul Hogan said to US TV viewers back in the 80s, let's just put another prawn on the barbie. But did he say that? No, he didn't. He said, let's put a shrimp on the barbie. Now, even though Australians call shrimps prawns, they couldn't say that because there was a cultural divide. It would have been lost. And we're just talking about language. So this is where... People like Target in the US, 340,000 people, they spoke at Red Hat Summit a couple of, for a couple of years about their cultural transformation using Red Hat's products in DevOps. And this is it, culture is it. And the point about, let's look at communication. So communication is, you know, are we actually communicating in a way that's right? Are we communicating in a way that people are listening? Are we computer communicating in a way that is helpful? And I think the question is, is anyone listening when we are communicating? Or are we doing it in a way that is convenient for them? And do people actually really want to listen? And this is my point. I'm not sure that with DevOps that we are doing that in an, in an effective way as possible. Things like WhatsApp and email don't really cut it. 
The other issue is around KPIs and incentives, and I think we're all in agreement that between you know the biz, dev, and ops, that these differences exist. And so along the KPI chain, there is a breakdown between how each other's are motivated to get an outcome. Okay, so the other is then, I've got two KPIs I think that I want to introduce. The first is, are you proud of that? And I think this guy from Dave, David Bullock from BNZ, Bank of New Zealand, is outstanding. It's a brilliant idea. If you're not proud of the code, then why put it into production? The second one is from myself, and that is, would you recommend your workplace as a, as a, place to, as a preferred place to work? HR managers know that people who are engaged and have a high net promoter score are more willing to be productive, energised and motivated to go and do stuff. The third area is around empathy. And now we kind of get the joke that dev and ops hate each other and there's been this sort of iron curtain between the two. But really, what's it like to walk in the other person's shoes? Are we doing a really, really good job in understanding what it's like to be in the other person's shoes? And this is where I think the Agile Manifesto has really helped to break down that, where we're talking about focusing on an outcome as opposed to a process or an architectural documentation. We're not necessarily negotiating, we're trying to adapt and get an outcome. And that's focusing on the right things. The other is then the testing models. So this is where I think behaviour-driven uh, development is really helping to figure out, let's focus on the outcome and what the business actually wants as opposed to does that test pass, even though the functionality doesn't actually deliver the business outcome. Then the third is about, so the last one's about leadership, and I think there's a lack of leadership in some ways from the top or the bottom. If you have a top-down approach to DevOps, then you are forced to give up ground. If you've got a bottom-up approach, then you want to give up ground and get an outcome together, and I think leadership or lack of it has a lot to do there. So with these five interdependent issues, we, if we don't have a level of understanding, then we go back to our silos of experience and expertise, and we don't really want to go and talk to each other. And I, I'm asking you, do you actually want to basically break those silos, break that nexus, and come together? Do, you, do we actually really want it? Does the senior leadership actually want to break down those silos? And that's a really, really important question. Um, the other is, when we, do we actually understand the supply chain of code, the interdependencies from business as idea to develop it coding stuff, then code actually getting out to production? And if we don't actually really understand those interdependencies and have a genuine, authentic understanding of it, then there's going to be further breakdown. So what's one of the answers? Well, beer is the answer. And I, and I mean, basically, go and have beers with people who are formally in your team and who are informally in your team, like the CFO or the brand manager. And if you don't like beer, well, that's fine, go and have coffee or copy. It's a heck of a lot cheaper and it's much healthier. But the point about it is that do this regularly, get to know people. And as one guy from Red Hat said, so much of DevOps is taking your enemy out to lunch on Friday afternoon and coming back as friends. The other is do it often, show and tell. And this again comes from Target's story about their DevOps journey is they would constantly be doing show and tell stories and sessions to all the stakeholders up and down the, the sort of supply chain, so to speak. So tell your story often so that people actually get excited. And here's a final example of a bank in Australia that did it. And they had a great change agent that came in that had a great relationship from the business and IT, and he forced change in, but there were people that wanted to come around and deliver that type of value. And you can see from five months versus two years, the results were outstanding. Thanks very much. Uh, hello, everybody. So um, my name is... Uh Ian Mujak, so I'm a DevOps lead at Standard Chartered. So I'm the guy who tried to create uh, unstoppable force that can try to move immovable object. Uh, today we talk, uh, how can I try to do that? Or how can I see it in the future to go, we'll go a little bit beyond DevOps. So we talk until now, everybody, most of the speaker talk what we're doing with the DevOps. So is it DevOps the end goal? Or is it just a process now evolutionally development? So how far we will go? Uh, at some point, we'll need a method, um, a method which is, will describe what is the future of the DevOps in the next five, ten years, or is it DevOps will exist? And like one of the quotes, we are the repeatedly do excellence that is not at the, is not at the, is not an act by the habit by Aristotle. So, let's go to the old school. So, in the old school, we knew everything, so we have a very stable environment, so everything go by the plan, waterfall, waterfall, wrap methodologies like plan, requirements, development, test, deploy. It worked. It was slow, but it worked. So new complex system came. So projects become very complex. So, and we start thinking about more, more agile frameworks to implement. So we try to address the complexity. 
So Agile tried to fix the problem with the complexity. So Agile designed to deal with specification will never be fully understood. The user will never know what they want until after the system is in production. So interactive system can never be fully specified or they can be fully tested. And software evolves more rapidly and they chaotic. And Agile time frame, I mean, it's pretty old uh, time. They started in 1992, basically with the Crestal method. 1995, Scrum. 1999, we have a, a extreme programming and Lean came later. Everything came to the Agile Manifesto in 2001 by submitting guys in Utah who, who went to, to specific core manifesto that everybody follows since then or believe in them. Uh, Agile basically representative as we move from very silos more on the business. So we try to marry the business with the development. This is what happened during the Agile, but we still have somehow left operation aside like a lost child. Uh, in 2011, the Ken Bex came with another more manifesto, which is more oriented to the startup vision, team vision and discipline, validated learning, customer discovery, initiate change. Um, as a DevOps side, so as a timeline, we have starting in 2008 and culminating in 2010 with the first DevOps days in Montevideo, California. That's, it's already, we have almost seven years, six years since so on the DevOps side, everything we try to plan and merit operation with the development and the business where we classify, we structure, we have now everything continuous testing, still the manual testing, and we still try to deploy in the SITs. We get a very clear metrics, time to delivery, deployment, frequency, change, volume, success rate. So we pay more attention and mean time to recovery, which is a few metrics which is very important. Uh, everything went, but innovation still, we innovation start increasing, but the problem with the management is still, innovation management is still in crisis. So we pretty much start with the Deming from the father of the Lean movement and father of the Kanban, we can say it. Uh, beyond DevOps, we have all this tooling. Now that we have a team, so basically goes beyond this. So we have a new concepts like no ops, distributed ops, and biz DevOps, which is go a little bit beyond. Uh, Beyond, beyond in the sense now we go additionally with a, additional to continuous integration, we go to continuous deployment into production with a, if, but this, is, this team need to be very, very stable and very mature to achieve this level. Um, capital, so again, all this innovation is driven by startups, let's say. Uh, venture capital investing in Silicon Valley is 15 billion. Uh, every year, S or if you compare with Standard Poor's, for example, 500 companies, they will pay the shareholders around $1 trillion only this year. Uh, has, again, pace of innovation if you go with the adoptions. So adoption is almost, we have innovation 10 times faster than adoption period. Innovation will still increase if you bring the AI, which is coming in. In startups area, the mind drivers innovation, they, during the 80s, they tried to focus with the com companies that poorly run. During the 90s, they focused on the company actually well managed. They still disrupt, managed to disrupt them. And now even these startups, after five years, they already feel pressure of disruptions. What we can expect? So startup here, mentality enterprise level. So the lean startup. Enterprise, we start decoupling innovation. So this, the, the big companies, we start creating the startups around them. Blur line between the business, so, and again, we are hiring for Sarah Charter another <laughs> sales call. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Angad, and uh, uh, I recently joined Twitter Singapore as part of the data, data team, and uh, previously I was working at uh, Wiki, uh, which is a part of Rakuten, as the DevOps, uh, DevOps lead for that. Uh, so today, uh, that's my pretty face, which you can also see here. Uh, so, so today I'll be talking about uh, why standards matter and why, what's, what's so important about standards in DevOps. Uh, so the, the, the main thing that I want to uh, drive home, the main point that I want to drive home today, like whether, you, whether or not you like the word standards or not, uh, I mean, you want to give it a different word, you want to call it process or uh, you want to call it plan, sure. But have, having standards, having processes, having plans is better than ha not having any plans. So uh, we, we, we work in an industry where, where uh, our decisions are, can, be, can mean life or death for someone, either for ourselves, if we do the wrong thing, or 
uh, something that can go down for somebody else. Right? So, so just like pilots or just like uh, people in the aircraft industry, they have certain standards, they have certain checklists. We also need to codify our, our, our daily day-to-day -day works in, in standards. So this is what I define DevOps as. Right? You can read that there's microservices, you have infrastructure automation, uh, we want to gear towards developer productivity, uh, and there's this uh, incident management, which I like to call debugging all layers. Right? I mean, incident management is uh, where you want to make sure that uh, whatever happens once does not happen again. Like whatever bug happens once doesn't happen again. And we also take care of cost management. Uh, every startup, every company is moving towards microservices. And I've worked at companies and I've, uh, where there are 40 to 50 microservices. That's 2x more the number of actual engineers. And sure, that, that will happen. So I want, you to, I want to invite you to think uh, in a certain way that let's say if you're, if you're the DevOps engineer and I double the number of microservices or services that you're managing. How will, how will your processes change? Or how will you do things differently? Right? So there are certain best practices that you can incorporate in your daily uh, workflow. Uh, these are some of the examples. So for example, you have 10 services that connect to Redis or MySQL. And each, let's say each of the developers wrote their own library for connecting to Redis. They have their own retry logic. Now that's 10 different ways where, where bugs can appear. Wouldn't it be beneficial if you have some shared library that all took care of that? Uh, another example, security. That can be a good friend or a really big nightmare for you. Right? Uh, you need to make sure that all your servers are following the consistent firewall rules, and if something breaks, you make sure you get alerted. Uh, you use standard input sanitization libraries across all places. One thing that I, I'm really OCD about is, is so frameworks or services that do not lo log to where log. They, they decide, oh, we'll log to opt, and then the developer wastes, like, a developer is coming on board to a new service, and he wastes three hours on, uh, uh, on finding where the logs are. So, DevOps is also comes very close to cost optimization, right? So if, you're, if your company is doing well, I mean, your infrastructure cost should be well maintained, it's lower, and your main, your, your main costs are on the business logic, on your, on your, on your engineering costs, right? Uh, so, and then you have tons of microservices, and you want to make sure that all of these services, they follow the same pathway uh, as, they, as they move to production. Uh, so you have unit tests and everything. Right. Uh, the next thing is, how do you get the engineering mindset to change? So engineering onboarding is where you start, pro like start putting your standards or start talking about your plans. Uh, you raise the bar, bar with new hires. As new people join in, it's easier to uh, make, make things. Uh, another OCD thing of mine, like you, you need to have like consistent naming. Uh, do not let developers name your services. They'll name them, like what, Eagle, Falcon, or something, but give services proper names. Image processing service should be called image processing service and nothing else, right? Uh, standard provisioning, you have, uh, you use all the new tools, Ansible, Chef, or Docker, right? I mean, have a plan, uh, and that's, that's, that's the more important part. Uh, next, we talk about configuration, right? Uh, so you, you have console, zookeeper, and all of these uh, really amazing tools that you can use. Uh, let's say you, ha you want to ch make a configuration change. You do not want to be editing 20 text files to make that configuration change. It should be as simple as hot reloadable configuration, right? So with all of these things in mind, what, we, what, what I come to a conclusion is that the DevOps is a shared bus uh, across, the, across the engineering of a, of a company, uh, which identifies patterns for across all services, which makes it easier for you to handle complexity there are benefits of microservices, and that's a different flame war that we can have later. Uh, but DevOps is the shared bus. And it's a small team, uh, small team that which, which really has a lot of context and a lot of communication. Right? And it's, it's working really closely with, with the developers as well. And we want to enforce standards, but not in a way that it, 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 uh, it stifles innovation. Right? We want to ensure standards uh, with, with, with logic and, and common sense, of course, right? and uh, working very closely with the developers. Uh, and then finally, it's all about give and take. Uh, this is a joke. Please don't <laughs> take it seriously. <laughs> so I want to I leave you with the final slide. Uh, this is from XKCD. Uh, think, think about this. So I mean, yes, standards have their, or processes have their drawbacks. But it's important to have a standard or process than not to have one, just to be able to think up deep, uh, deeply about your systems. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Five minutes to get a point across is actually pretty intense, as you can probably tell. So my name is Stefan, and I'm on, I'm on a mission. I want to make security great again, great again. So in order to do this, we all know that development has gotten much faster in these days, but security is still stuck in the, in the waterfall times, ages. 
So I want to show you that actually it can be done. So first of all, what is application security? It's really a quality aspect of your application. And it's a critical success factor for your business success, similar to performance or usability. Um, but why is AppSec always considered with so much pain and sufferance and slowing everything down? The reason is because more often than not, the people actually responsible for it don't understand applications or development. And I'm sure many of you have been in this situation. You have like a release coming up and you get this 150 page PDF report with a lot of issues and you have a couple of days to fix it. Here you go. The truth is that um, for us, from a security point of view, we actually feel like, it's stopping. We actually feel like we are doing a good job. We actually feel like things are going well and we are reaching the top of this mountain where we're doing a good job. Um, but in the meantime, but in the meantime, um, outside of the security camp, things are actually changing quite dramatically. And this kind of reminds me of this uh, analogy of the frog sitting in a po uh, pot of water that slowly gets hotter, but the frog doesn't really realize it. The truth is that um, the frequency of releases is increasing ever, uh, like all the time. So in the early 2000s, it was once a year, then once a quarter, once a month, twice a month, and it's going towards continuous delivery. And that's where it should be, right? But so when you look back to the security point of view now, we are standing on, the, on this mountain and it feels like there's this storm front coming up. So many releases, how can you possibly paint a sort of them? There's not enough time. So it turns out that in the meantime, while we're standing up and climbing up on this mountain, the development world, still, the development world has really changed a lot since then. And it turns out we're not even close to getting up there. So there has to be a better way. There has to be a way where we can actually change the things, uh, the way things are done and uh, uh, make this successful. Unfortunately, there is a way and it's called DevSecOps. So if you combine Agile plus DevOps plus security, you get DevSecOps. And this is a really powerful formula that's gonna change the way software is done forever. So how do you do it? Step one, you have to embed security into Agile. You have to make it a part of the development process. And it doesn't really matter what the process looks like. It really only matters that, um, for example, if you look at Scrum, this is whatever you do right now. Security is not the thing that you have to model yourself after, but Security Act has to actually come and say, hey, how can we fit into this, no matter what you do? And so if you look at Secure Scrum, it looks exactly the same as the normal Scrum, but you actually start slicing in these uh, different security activities over time, and not at once. But because we only have a little time now, I'm gonna uh, focus on two of the most important activities here. One, security user stories, because this is where it all starts. You have to get the security requirements in the user stories and the security acceptance criteria as well, because then most of the issues won't even happen. And the good thing is that if you have the security user stories in there, you can only use them, also use them for unit tests. And you know, unit tests is a very important quality criteria of the application. And it really only starts at 100% code coverage. That's the beginning. And security acceptance tests can really help with that. But now you might be thinking, um, that sounds like a lot of work, right? The truth is, yes, it is some work, but after some sprints and you actually start incorporating these activities, things will get much easier and you actually build security right in. And when you get there, that's actually the sweet spot. And this is actually where DevSecOps happens. DevSecOps is also known as uh, automate all the things. And what this means is that you essentially take what you had before, your uh, security development lifecycle, where security is already built in, and you start also implementing tools in the build pipelines. You actually start making use of all these tools out there to get instant feedback on the source quality, on your runtime, and even attacks going on in, in production. You want this instant feedback. Okay, so instead of doing this and actually having DevOps unicorns run away from security and security is trying to chase them, there's a better way that we can actually do this. So instead of doing this, let's just do something that looks like this. Oh yeah. <laughs> let's all work together and make sure that DevOps and security actually becomes a great team that can work together to change the world with software. One release at a time. Thank you. Hi. 
Oh, wow. This is a really sensitive microphone. How's everybody doing today? Cool. So my name is Seth Vargo. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Seth Vargo. I'm the director of technical advocacy at HashiCorp. So I work with that Mitchell dude who did that opening keynote this morning. That's my picture. It looks nothing like me, but I keep it on the internet because I think I look better there than I do here. So DevOps, kind of in the purest form, really started as a cultural movement. And we've talked a lot about tech, so I, I want to talk a little bit about culture. Specifically, I want to tell you what to do to how, uh, how to make your team terrible. So these are 10 tips to create a toxic tech team, and I challenge anyone to say that three times very quickly. Um, or 10 tips to create a toxic culture. So the first tip here is to discourage salary discussions. So in most countries, it's actually illegal to discourage discussions among coworkers about how much each other make. But if you are discouraged to talk about how much you make, that means there's probably inequality on your team. It probably means that the women are making less than the men, that the people of different races or different skin colors are making less because you're discouraging a salary discussion. It tells people that it's not okay to talk about how much we make because we often tie how much we weight, how much we make to our value. Speaking of value, the next tip is to have really abstract values and goals. Like, we're going to make America great again. <laughs> I could say nothing for 10 seconds. That was worth it. <laughs> again, kind of playing off of that is to, to create scapegoats. So we're going to blame somebody else every time something goes wrong. This is the, the kind of the anti-DevOps pattern. Oh, prod broke. Well, it's, it's the ops team's fault. They, they did the thing. Or, or dev wrote the wrong thing. But it's actually everyone's responsibility. So instead of blaming one person, you actually need to blame everyone. But in an anti-DevOps culture, it's definitely that dude's fault over there. He totally broke prod. And you know the key to these things is just to keep talking until the next slide pops up. Like, only hire cronies. So cronies is kind of a, a weird English word. It means like friends or buddies. Uh, and this happens a lot in... Uh, traditional like Silicon Valley startups where like you hire your friends and they only hire their friends and you create like this monoculture where you have one way of thinking and one way of doing things and you don't think outside of the box. Not only does this hurt your diversity, but it also help, hurts your ability to innovate. It hurts your ability to penetrate a market because you're only thinking one way. So the first thing I challenge everyone to do as a manager is hire somebody who looks, acts, and thinks differently than you. Kind of closely related to that is to play favorites. So you only hire the people who look like you. You only promote the people who look like you. You only promote the people who act like you and think like you. Not only does that hurt diversity, but it hurts your company. Unlimited vacation is one I want to spend time talking about. Uh, how many people work for a company that has unlimited vacation? So that's a thing in the US, and it's actually really harmful. Because if I told all of you you have a million dollars, you would go out and spend all million dollars. But if I told you you had unlimited money, studies show that you would actually spend somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars And that's because as humans, we can't actually grasp this concept of infinity. So we're unlikely to use it. When a company offers you unlimited vacation, it means we're telling you you could have zero days of vacation or you could have a million days of vacation. But because there's no finite number, there's no concrete attachment to it, we don't know what is acceptable. And when we're comparing ourselves to our peers, it becomes a competition. Closely related to that is this, this uh, non-separation of work-life balance, where we expect people to work 60, 70, 80, 100 hours per week. You're working on Saturdays and Sundays to meet deadlines. We destroy that work-life balance. And also, loyalty. Uh, a lot of these companies are like, oh, we're going to give you a billion stock options so that you stay with us. But that, that's not real money. Loyalty comes from like being in love with the work you do, being in love with the people you work with, and really truly believing in the mission, believing in the product. So if you're just trying to keep people around just so that they feel like they're part of the company, that's really not a good way to encourage collaboration and encourage innovation within your organization. Uh, and lastly, and, and probably the most important thing, is to treat humans as data points. Uh, it's great to measure things, and it's great that we have metrics and monitoring, but at the end of the day, we're, we're all human, and sometimes we have to have a discussion of why things are happening. So just because your burn down chart isn't the greatest in the world, or because your issue counts don't correctly match what they predicted, there are other factors that have to come into account. And if we forget that, we just start treating everything like a data point, um, that's when you know, people really start leaving your company, and they, they start having a bad time. They don't want to be here anymore. And then making fake promises. This is a really big one that happens a lot. I promise you that you'll get a raise, or I promise you that we'll make that happen. 
you should never promise something that you don't know for sure is going to happen. And sometimes things are out of our circumstances, but it's very probable and it happens very frequently where organizations will make promises just to keep people around. Uh, and ultimately that's not what's in the best interest of that person or the company. So those are my 10 tips. Uh, you should do the opposite of those things for those of you that were paying attention if you want your team to succeed. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Thank you very much. Okay, hi there. I'm Clemens. I'm an economist who ended up in DevOps. So I might talk about a bit different things today. I'm not so keen about looking at uh, technology all the time. I like to see some other concepts behind it. I want to briefly touch two things that I think give me a good idea of what DevOps means, especially on the business levels. So when you are into tech and you are deeply into it, people tend to ask you what you think. So people ask me, do we need to do DevOps? And a while ago, I found out they don't ask me to get the information, what is DevOps, and <clears throat> what do we need to do? What they want to hear from me is telling them, you don't need to do anything. Stay as you want. Yeah. So <clears throat> the thing that I want to look at now is, can we actually go away from the complex stuff, can we stay simple all the time? So how much simple is left since the era of simple? 1995, when I started working on this stuff, we built easy websites, had static content, rudimental. We deployed via tar files, right? Uh, <coughs> only 10 years later, we had the web 2.0, everything must be dynamic, lots of APIs, front-end servers, deployments got very complex, we have the super complicated web applications on the way with lots of database backends and stuff. And now we have the big everything, right? So see the green stuff, which means that we have more and more complicated things going around in this, in this area, making us feeling funny. And it's complication, and it goes up. It never started somewhere. It started like 100,000 years ago but it's getting faster and faster and faster. And those dots mean we have a higher number of complex or complicated questions to answer, problems to fix, features to implement, decisions to make. And do we have any model that gives us an idea how do we handle these and what happens actually? And there is one which is called the Kinefin framework. It's one of the, the, the topics that I want to show you. So. It's made up in, in four areas, and the first area is called simple obvious, which means that every cause that you see and every effect are coupled directly. If you do the thing again, the same output will come to you. It's something that you can put into best practice, which means like uh, <coughs> change a password, right? Change a password is always the same thing. Now we get to complicated. Complicated means that there is still a connection between cause and effect, but it's not obvious. It is complicated. We might not see it on the first spot. We need expert, uh, expert input to figure out what is actually going on. If we move on to complex, complex is the stuff where we usually see something happening and then we say, oh yeah, I know why that happened. But you never know before that is going to happen. So you see it afterwards. You know what's going on when it happened. And the way to go on with these, with these, instead of using best practice or good practice, means that you have to bring people together and you let them talk for a while. You build a team. Uh, you have many, many <laughs> different uh, things on this team and then they discuss it. And if you are lucky, they come up with a solution. So my problem that I see is that we get more and more of the complex require complex ideas, complex, uh, oh, now I'm a bit off. Anyway, so 
what I wanted to say is, hey, but the co solutions, even for the complex problems, very often are still simple. We can see that if we go for customer support, when did you last time call a hotline and wanted to fix something? And instead of taking care of your complex, complex problem or your complicated problem, they just gave you a best practice. They run you through some item. Oh, now I'm really lost. Anyways, so <laughs> Ashby's law of requisite variety is the second concept that I wanted to point you to. Only variety absorbs variety. So if things get really complex, you have to get complex yourself. Um, simple system uh, to demonstrate it. Uh, we have a traffic light which has five different states. If we all just understand four states or, or three states, we never know what red means, then this will fail. There will be a lot of funny accidents at that traffic lights. So <coughs> to end it up, we can't keep it simple because the variety of our system grows towards complex. It's keeping, keep growing. Thanks. <laughs> Ask me if you want to hear more. So I have extra 20 seconds to talk about myself, which is awesome. I love talking about myself. That's more importantly. That's me. Uh, I'm Yagnik. I work at Snapdeal as an architect. Uh, I was the guy making funny comments about people being angry and telling me I don't want to leave my job. Uh, I have seen it. It was kind of shocking. Also, I've been raised in Canada. and it, I've seen minus 20, but I'm freezing my ass off here. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, maybe I'm sick. Uh, so I'm going to talk about infrastructure as code. Uh, I'm mostly going to go about my story at Snapdeal uh, and uh, tell you where it began and what changed and what all we are bringing in. So essentially, we're running a giant microservices architecture, uh, roughly around 300 Java Tomcats or web services with another 400 or so data stores running behind them. And uh, they are, it's a big, big architecture. But what I found out was when I came in, I asked, hey, how does this code get deployed? Or uh, where is the code there? How did you get it on this machine? Uh, where are the tests running? And all the questions had the same result from everyone. It was like, yeah, it's somewhere. Someone puts it somehow, uh, which was very confusing for me. So what I realized was it wasn't just me. It was pretty much across the board. Everyone in the company was really confused about how things are getting done. And uh, the first part of solving the war or the battle was to find your enemy and know your enemy. And that's where we went in and we're like, this is the next step. To do this, uh, we need to know exactly what's running, how it's running, where it's running, who it talks to, what it does. And uh, that's where our definition of infrastructure as code came in. So people have talked about configuration management. They've talked about uh, Terraform bringing in infrastructure, infrastructure as code and multiple meanings. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about how we did it at Snapdeal uh, in terms of what we told and what we, how we defined it. Uh, at its core, we had this giant YML file, one per organization, which is internal organization. And we would give you details about what's that component name is, who the owners are, which was important because we didn't even know who owned what per service. So if an error happened, hey, from those 1,000 email chains, you'll find one person who actually is owning this and can fix it. Uh, so that was the part we want to know. Then you have your what kind of service that you're running on it which is usually like Cassandra or Mongo. This gives us the detail about what kind of things each machine should be, and if it's doing something specific or something funky, some funky something random is running on there that shouldn't be. We'll find out from there. Uh, then obviously we had details of uh, deployment, where this code is, the first part of my problem, where this code is, that was solved by just explicitly saying, this deployable comes from this specific code piece, and uh, there's one way to deploy it. Uh, uh, next up was uh, monitoring, uh, which is uh, this code has multiple health checks. Uh, console and a bunch of other services have done a lot of things along those lines. Uh, so we got that knowledge here, and which told us what kind of notifications. I'm going to come. This may all seem like, why are you doing this? I didn't have a slide of why I'm doing this earlier. I'm just putting it in the end. But I'm going to come to why we're doing all of these things explicitly stated in a single file for every single developer of, across the company using it. So uh, we put in note information about ports which is uh, on which port this particular service runs and which all port it slashes. I use this information into opening my security groups. Uh, what I, so essentially all this, the next two slides are gonna go about other pieces that we add in. But I wanna take a second and talk about what we do building, uh, from this YML file, we actually create code 
to do rest of the provisioning and security and deployment. So imagine one single file giving you a Jenkins job automatically as soon as you merge in this change, which will create a new Jenkins job, which has the ability to dip, build that code into the format that we provide, which is uh, Java code in most cases at Snapdeal. Uh, we'll package it correctly into an RPM, and then it will be a, available on certain number of servers, which are auto-scalable and actually extend to whatever you need it to do. Uh, this is the abstraction layer we built for the developers in our company so that we have one single interface for everyone to talk about. The reason for doing, not giving everyone access to something like Terraform, which is what we use internally, is because it was really hard to teach everyone how things work, and it was even harder to make them follow the standards we want them to. So we put all our testing into just YML files. Write this, and you'll have all the information. Uh, so what runs behind this YML files is essentially a bun bunch of technologies that we have put together. Uh, if anyone knows about Ruby on Rails, uh, it's basically number of gems being put together, but the framework together makes sense. Uh, similarly, our whole stack is essentially a bunch of smaller technologies. So at its core, we have Azure, AWS, and OpenStack uh, clouds running. Uh, we use our infrastructure as code, what we call Dendrite, which is the YML file. Along with it, it is also code that will build provisioning in Terraform. So we build Terraform files, uh, we register it to console and use that. On top of it, we will have Salt, which will do our individual node configuration, and uh, finally the application code, which comes in as RPM. Uh, and that's it. So that's the end of how Snapdeal uses infrastructure as code to deploy any application and scale it. Hi, everyone. Uh, OK, uh, today I will give uh, uh, some introduction about uh, my startup. So my startup is a massive open online course, like uh, EDX, like uh, Coursera. So I want to share how we build the infrastructure inside the massive open online course. So this is my pretty picture. My name is uh, Rizky Aristiansa. I'm the chief technology officer of uh, my startup. The name is Indonesia X. We have about uh, five engineer. So we have about uh, five engineer. One one is DevOps, uh, two programmer, and uh, uh, two back end developer, and uh, one front end developer. And uh, I'm as a uh, yeah. Sometimes I I make as a full stack developer. Okay, that's my picture as uh, the dark feather in my team. Uh, this is my empire. <laughs> okay, um, first, uh, what is the MOOC? Uh, massive open online course. So massive is uh, like a student. Uh, we can have a student like uh, one, uh, one thousand, ten thousand of student, one hundred of thousand student, uh, and it and it's open. It's also online, and our content is uh, course content. So at this time, uh, Indonesia X is already have uh, eighty thousand user. So, but now I will try to explain uh, how we build uh, our. Uh, infrastructure. First, we use a uh, Python. Why? Because uh, Python is easy. It's a minimal setup. Uh, they have uh, Python have a lot of uh, module and libraries. First, we have a uh, learning management system inside our MOOC. This is for a uh, user, for the for our user to yeah to manage the course. We also have a cor uh, forum discussion. We also have an uh, exam. We also have uh, assessment. And next, we have a uh, course manage course management system. It's for uh, our instructor to manage. Uh, the course, and uh, I will show you uh, our architecture now. This is our architecture now. We use the engine X, we use the unicorn, and uh, at the center is our application. There is LMS, EMS, there is RabbitMQ, MongoDB, MySQL, and Memjets. I will explain why we use uh, uh, this service. First, uh, let's go with uh, MySQL. MySQL, we use this uh, to store our user profile, course enrollment. And uh, we also use for the our certificate, uh, and and then uh, MySQL we use for authentic authentication and authorization of data as well. And next we use a uh oh wait, <laughs> okay we use MongoDB. Uh, we use MongoDB for another database storage. This is for, uh, why we choose uh, MongoDB because uh, it's uh, easy to scale. This is not for student profile or co course enrollment, but we use MongoDB for to storing our course database because uh, it's a uh, NoSQL database. It uh, make uh, our team easy to to manage uh, the database. 
So we use uh, two different databases. First, uh, for course uh, course data, MongoDB and MySQL for student and certificate. And next is the mem memcache. This for high speed distribute key value, key value store for object caching. We use a memcache uh, for use uh, to catch a user session, to ch catching a course structure info. Uh, the process uh, is like uh, in our system. Uh, mostly, there is process uh, called mem memcache. There is a username memcache. We use uh, the default port of uh, mem memcaching, and the function is uh, for key value store. And next is uh, our web server. We use uh, Nginx in instead of uh, Apa Ap Apache. Uh, the Nginx also provide a provide proxy. We also use Nginx for load balancing of uh, our static asset and a dynamic asset and. Uh, Nginx is a uh, stateless and a horizon horizontally scalable. We use Nginx uh, for uh, we have a uh, for worker for WW data, double data. Oh, it's uh, for CMS and LMS and unicorn. Uh, this one, this one is uh, for our learning management system, and the next one is uh, for our course management uh, system. We use a uh, unicorn to dynamic work for dynamic worker management, and then it's a uh, stateless and a uh, Horizontal is scalable. Okay. Next, uh, we use the uh, Rabbit main, uh, Rabbit MQ. This is for a large jobs uh, around truck, uh, the query. We use this uh, with a uh, coordinator with a uh, salary. Why? Because uh, we also uh, we use this to like uh, generate the grade of uh, our exam. We we use uh, Rabbit MQ also for generate uh, the certificate in our system. Yeah, that's uh, the simple infrastructure we built uh, in uh, our startup. I think uh, five minutes is not enough to explain uh, more about our infrastructure because uh, we, we we have to explain like our so how we use our server AWS, how we use uh, uh, yeah Engine X. Yeah, five minutes is not enough. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, thank you, thank you to all the Ignite speakers, guys. We should just give them another round of applause to all of them. Uh, and I just want to call out uh, uh, Soju, who has been hounding these nine people for the last week or so. I don't think they were ever want to hear from him again. Uh, that's how many emails uh, he sent them for the slides. Right. So uh, that was really uh, charged up.